I, uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, you know, I spoke here at the conference, well, I think it's two years ago. And, you know, it's, it kind of puts pressure on you when you're invited to come back to a place again. It's kind of an honor to be invited back, but it puts a little added pressure on you. Because when you, when you come the first time, and most people have, have not heard you before, and then when you hear that you're an agricultural economist, if you just do a halfway decent job, they're relieved and appreciate it. <laughs> but when you're invited back somewhere, then that means they have expectations and, and puts pressure on me to try to live up to the expectations of those people that have invited me to come back again this year. And then in addition to that, I have a little added pressure because my, my brother and sister and sister-in-law that lived out in Lee Summit, Missouri, they come up to hear me speak today. And so, now that puts a little more burden on me, but I tell you what, I'll just do the best that I possibly can, and then I'll just hope that you're that you're not disappointed. You know, there'll be some overlap, I guess, with the the last time I was here, uh, but I've tried to minimize that. So, if you miss some things that you don't think I'm going into enough depth, well, you can go back and read the paper from the last time. But anyway. I'm going to try to address the theme of the conference here today, as you heard from Don, the title I chose was Securing American Agriculture for Independent Family Farms. And, and the theme of the conference is arming the movement for an independent family agriculture. Now your next speaker is going to address this, but I'll address it as well. It's the, why do you need a movement for independent family agriculture in this country? According to the USDA, 96% of the farms in this country, and they include farms and ranches, and that 96% are family farms because they're family owned and they're family operated. With respect to independence, you know, American farmers have always, have always championed the idea of being independent, you know, that's the characteristic of family farms is, is it's our land and we can do whatever we want with it. We're independent. Even going all the way back to Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson talked about the yeoman farmer, the family farmer, he said they have the, the, the virtue and independence that is essential to democracy. And he said that the government should support family farms for that reason and that they should not support simply businesses because businesses didn't necessarily function in the public interest, whereas family farmers did. So why do we need why do we need an independent family farm movement? Well, I suspect most of you that are, that are here today, you understand why we need a family farm movement because family farming in this country has been under attack for at least the last 50 years. And we know that it's been harder and harder for the independent family farm to survive on farming in this country over the last 50 years at least and perhaps even more. But most people in American society today, they don't understand what's been going on in agriculture. They don't understand enough about agriculture to know what's going on and less about, you know, the distinction between family farms and what I call industrial farms. And they're not being helped in that regard because there is also this so-called modern agriculture movement that's, that is, that has been systematically making it more increasingly difficult for family farms to survive. And, and they've been promoting their agenda cloaked in the, in the distinguished cloak of honor that's been hard won by family farmers over decades. So the, so the general public doesn't understand what's been happening in, in agriculture. But I know the difference, and you know the difference, between a corporately controlled industrial agricultural operation and the tr traditional family farm. I think I may know the difference better than most people just simply because my age, because I've lived through that transition whenever independent family farms, true family farms were the characteristic of the common agriculture in this country to where today, that our agriculture, at least from a production standpoint, is dominated by large corporately controlled, corporately influenced farming operations today. But even more important than, than knowing 
you know, where we've come from, is, is I know why that happened. Or at least I say what I say is my truth. My truth is I know why that transition took place and I understand how that transition took place. And in addition to that, I have come to the conclusion and I know in my heart that if there is to be a future of agriculture in this country, that, that we have to return to the traditional values that were embodied in family farms. And that includes the social and ethical values, not just the economic values that are there in family farming. I'm not saying we go back to the farming as it was in the past, but we, we respect those traditional values that were there and we reflect those values in farms of the future. So I started off in life and I was growing up, I was born in 1939 and I grew up in the 1940s and the 50s and it was a traditional family farming operation at that time. I grew up on a small dairy farm as Don said, my brother is still on that farm, it's still small and it was always maintained as a small family farm. But by the time I had received my PhD from the University of Missouri in 1970, we were on the cusp of a major change in agriculture, a major change in farming and a major change in farm policy. I had a professor at the University of Missouri that many of you may remember, or have heard about, probably met by the name of Harold Brymark, who was later my mentor as well as my professor in college. And Harold Brymark had a saying that he told all of his students and he would tell farmers and anybody else that would listen, Harold would say, we can have any kind of agriculture we want if we simply develop and implement the right farm policies to get it. I believe that. I saw it happen. The justification for farm policy, specifically for farm policy in this country, has always been and still is the only logical justification is to provide for domestic food security. If it's simply about the economics of farming or exports, then that belongs in the Department of Commerce. And if it's about biofuels, then it belongs in the energy or EPA or somewhere else. But the only reason you can argue that the public should support farming is to provide food security for this nation. That's the public justification. That's service to the to the common good. And domestic food security was the purpose when we originally had the early farm programs that come on in the 1930s because the country was in the middle of a, of a depression. And farmers, family farmers across the country were going broke. And Roosevelt, some of the others looked out and said, if we lose our farmers, we lost the food security of the country. And for have food security, we have to keep up these farmers stay on the farm and they put together programs in the early programs that provided economic security for family farmers as a means of providing food security for the country. And that was the focus of the programs until the 1970s. And that's the period of time I thought was going to be, you know, fundamental change in this country. At that time, we had Nixon come in and brought Earl Butts, who was the agricultural economist from Purdue, and they had a different agenda. And they were at a different time. We'd come through the 1960s when there had been a refocus on rural poverty and hunger in rural areas. And they said, what we need to do is this kind of agriculture isn't feeding the poor people in rural areas. We need a fundamental change in pharmacy policy. And they sold it based on domestic food security. But they said, what we need to do now is we need to focus on improving the economic efficiency of agriculture in this country because we need to make good food affordable to everyone and if we improve the efficiency of agriculture then we can bring down the cost of production it'll bring down the cost of food and we will make good food affordable for everyone it was the technologies that came out of world war ii the chemical and by the chemical te mechanical technologies it was the the fertilizers commercial fertilizers and pesticides that made it possible to make that transition then from the diversified independent family farms to the industrial specialized industrial farms that we have today. It was the technologies that made it possible, 
but it was the government policy that made it inevitable. You see, the, the policies incentivized, subsidized, and protected the, the industrialization of agriculture, basically what it is. What industrialization is about is specialized, specialized in doing fewer things so you can be more efficient, but once you specialize, then you have to standardize so that you can routinize and you can mechanize, and once you've routinized and mechanized, you've simplified the management process, and now you can consolidate into ever larger operations and achieve economies of scale, and that's basically what we did. So it was the technologies, the fertilizers and pesticides that allowed farming farmers to move away from the diversified family farming operations that most many of us in my time grew up on, moved to specialize in either crops and livestock, and then in one crop, one species of livestock, and then in one phase of production. And then the mechanization that was first the tractors that came out of World War II, but ever increasingly sophisticated machines that allowed farmers to farm more acres, to manage more head of livestock, and then livestock eventually to basically move the livestock off of the land and into factories that operate much more like factories in the large confinement animal feeding operations or factory farms than they do like farms. Specialization, standardization, consolidation, and now corporate consolidation with control among the large multinational corporations is the process that which we industrialized agriculture and it was public policies, farm policies that made that possible because the industrial model of agriculture is inherently risky. Industrialization is risky but particularly in agriculture because you have to make large investments in equipment, large investments in land to continue to expand in buildings and so on and you're dealing with a kind of production system that's vulnerable to unpredictable weather as we're seeing today that you can wipe out a crop in an instant and diseases that can wipe out crops and wipe out livestock operation particularly when they're concentrated. It's agriculture that's characterized by periodic overproduction where production outstrips demand and you end up with chronic reductions in prices. It's a tremendously risky kind of agriculture. So what they did is they devised farm policies that absorb the risk. They let the taxpayer, you and I, absorb a big share of the risk that's associated with industrial agriculture, and we continue to do that today, but we've done it all along. We did it with price supports, which basically said, maybe low prices, but you don't have to endure those low prices. We did it with efficiency payments that made up the difference. We've done it with subsidized crop insurance, so that if you have a crop failure, now we guarantee the price, and we subsidize about 60% of the crop insurance programs today in addition to subsidizing the providers of it. And whenever everything else fails, we have a disaster, then we come in and bail out with a disaster. We had a disease wiped out a lot of layer hens up in, in Iowa and other places a few years back, and, and there was someone did an estimate on that, they paid paid $14 a bird for every bird that was lost, every hen that was lost. In addition to that, they paid to clean up the village. You and I paid for that. It's a very risky kind of operation, and it's not just a risk on that. It's low interest loans, government guaranteed loans, tax credits, all of that made it easy and feasible to specialize, standardize, consolidate into larger and larger operations. Without those programs, you couldn't afford the kind of agriculture we did because you couldn't bear the risk. But Earl Butts convinced Congress and other people, other economists were involved in that. It convinced Congress that what this country needs is a more efficient agriculture. That's the way we'll get domestic food security. They changed farm policies and they got what they wanted. They wanted to industrialize agriculture, they changed farm policies, and we ended up with an industrial agriculture. That's what we have today. You know, I believe that. That's what I was taught in the graduate school. All this was going to work out. I, that's what I was taught. That's what I taught when I got out of school. I always went out and worked with farmers around the country, and I was one that told them, you need to get bigger, be prepared to get bigger, get out. You're going to have to have economies of scale to become con convinced. First half of my 30 year academic career I taught that, that, that farming has to move away from family farms or something of the past, that farming of the future has to be a business, a bottom line business. You know, if it's a family farm, don't let the family get its business get in the way of the farming business because you can't gain efficiency and you're not going to survive. 
I was convinced it was going to be good for family farmers. The innovative family farmers would prosper from this new and more efficient agriculture. They would profit by reducing their cost relative to the production overall. And those farmers that didn't want to transition over, then they would find better paying opportunities somewhere else. It was going to be good for rural communities. It was going to ensure the future prosperity of communities. We'd have viable communities going into the future. And we were going to provide food security. We'd bring down the cost of food. But the most important thing is that we were going to make good food affordable for everyone. It wasn't until the farm financial crisis of the 1980s that I began to question all that I had been taught and what I had been teaching. And it was about this time that, that the farmers who had been following what we so-called experts had said about getting big or getting out, those farmers had gotten big and they had borrowed a lot of money in order to get big at record high interest rates because the global markets we were going to export then were going to grow forever and it was always going to be prosperous in the future. They had gotten big, borrowed a lot of money, and then all of a sudden we got into a global recession. The export markets dried up, commodity prices dropped like a rock, and farmers were being forced out of business. Those that had gotten big now, rather than getting out, now they were getting out because they didn't have a choice. Farm foreclosures and bankruptcies with regular fare on the network news programs at that time. At that time, I moved to the, the University of Georgia as head of the Extension Agricultural Economics Department. And we had several farmers in Georgia that committed suicide. That was the way they got out of agriculture. And then I looked around and I could see what was happening to the rural communities were dying as they boarded up the store fronts. It takes people to support rural communities, not just production. It takes people to shop on Main Street for heart, you know, clothes and shoes and haircuts and cars and various other things. And it takes people to have kids to keep the rural schools open. It takes people to have to set in the church pews. We were destroying all of that. There weren't better paying occupations or jobs anywhere for the farmers, not in rural communities, not anywhere else as the communities were dying. And then I began to notice that farming fence row to fence row and tearing out the fence row, the erosion was everywhere and we were polluting the air and the water with agricultural chemicals and biological waste. And I had to come to the conclusion there's something fundamentally wrong. This kind of agriculture is not sustainable. It's not sustainable for the land ecologically. It's not sustainable for communities socially. It's not economically sustainable, certainly not for the family farms in the long run, not for farming. And not only that, it didn't provide food security. Today we import about 15% of the food in this country. If this was China, they would consider they had a crisis with food insecurity. We just take it in stride. We're importing 60% of our fruits and vegetables, about 80% of our fish, our seafood. And in addition to that, one out of eight people in this country is still classified as food insecure. One out of six children, 17%, almost 17% live in food insecure homes. We didn't solve the hunger problem. We can't solve hunger with cheap food. We have to deal with that in some other way. In addition to that, we've got an epidemic of diet-related health diseases that are associated with, with the changes in the American diet, the changes in the food system, obesity and diabetes and heart disease and high blood pressure and a whole range of cancer. And they've increased directly with the industrialization of agriculture and with food system. I simply couldn't continue to support this kind of agriculture. This is what I call industrial agriculture today. I had to do something else fundamentally different and luckily the sustainable agriculture movement was coming along at about that time and sustainable agriculture for those that take it seriously sustainable agriculture means an agriculture that's able to meet the needs basic food needs of everyone in the present and to do it in a way that does not diminish opportunities of those of future generations to meet their needs as well it has to be ecologically sound, socially responsible, economically viable. 
If we, we degrade the natural productivity of the soil through erosion and pollution and destruction of the life in the soil, then we destroy the long run ability to produce. It's not sustainable from a production standpoint. If we don't meet the needs of society, there's no reason society should support that agriculture. And it's not just about providing food. It's about opportunities for people employment. It's about providing, meeting the needs of people as citizens and taxpayers and being a, a viable part of a healthy economy and healthy economy when we meet the needs of people in society. And if we fail to do that, society won't support it and it won't go away. And finally, it has to be economically viable for the farmers. You have to be able to make a living doing things that are ecologically sound and socially responsible and you have to have all three it's not one or the other or the other you know i've been at this business now of trying to do whatever i can to make up for the damage i did in the past by supporting a more sustainable approach to agriculture and i, I think i've learned some lessons over this past 30 years you know again it's kind of my truth you may disagree with this and that's okay I've changed my mind, as I've told you before, but I've learned some of the lessons. And I think even though we have a strong, sustainable agriculture movement in this country, we're not going to have a sustainable agriculture movement in this country, truly. It's not going to be dominant until we have a fundamental change in farm policy. Until we have a change in farm policy that's subsidizing an industrial, destructive, exploitive, extractive, sustainable agriculture, you're not playing on a level playing field when you're trying to be a traditional family farmer or trying to farm sustainably. We have to have a fundamental change in farm policy. And the other lesson that I have learned that to have a sustainable agriculture, we have to return to the fundamental values of traditional family farms, the social values, the ethical values of taking care of the land, of being responsible members of communities, and of the economic values that looks at the economics of a farm as simply a means of allowing someone to do the things that they really feel they ought to do and want to do their life from a, from a social and ethical standpoint. The economy was never meant to be the end or the goal. It's simply a means of doing something else. But all of those things have to be in place and all of those things were there in the traditional family farms. Farm, farm, farming was about a place to raise a family, a place to be a part of a community, a place to interact with other people, to fulfill a responsibility, a place to be a steward of the land, to take care of the land and pass it on from generation to generation as productive as what it was passed to you. But if you look at the USDA definition of family-owned farms today, we see those family-owned farms, that 96% of the farms out here that are eroding the soil and polluting the air and water with agricultural chemicals and biological waste. And we see the demise and destruction that's been brought into rural communities as they're abandoned by the people that can no longer make a living there. And our rural areas have been turned into rural ghettos. A Wall Street Journal article about a year ago went through a whole list of ranges and they called the rural communities, the new inner cities and a whole range of indicators. They now, rural areas now rank lower on a various things such as unemployment and teen uh, pregnancy and, and, and early death from heart disease and various other things. The new inner city, that's the consequence of industrial life and agriculture. And we still have one in six of our children that live in food insecure homes while our so-called family farmers are producing crops for fuel for our automobiles. We need to get back to the family farm values. I think most family farmers in this country still hold those values. I think they feel trapped and locked into a system that's stifling those values and probably been stifled by decades of neglect as they've been forced to do things that they do not want to do simply to survive economically. I think they want to be family farms with the traditional values. What we need is the right kind of farm policies that allow those farmers to do what in their heart they want to do rather than what they feel 
forced to do. I'm not talking about bribing farmers to farm sustainably or to do things of this nature. I'm talking about policies that make it possible for them economically to do what they want to do and to live out and fulfill their values as family farmers. You know, the kind of change I'm talking about is not going to be easy because there are very powerful defenders of the status quo in agriculture, as you know. The large corporations are benefiting tremendously from this, and the larger farming operations are still out there that are benefiting tr from it, tr not tremendously, but maybe they're benefiting from it, but, but their time is coming to an end also, because eventually this whole of agriculture, if we don't change policy, is going to be controlled by a handful of multinational corporations, and there's going to be nobody producing agricultural commodities that's going to do anything more than just eke out a subsistence living under somebody else's control. But there's still powerful forces that are defending this. And those powerful economic forces have developed powerful political power. They virtually control the state and federal governments in this country. You find they control all of the agricultural committees at the federal level. You can't get anything through Congress at the federal level that's going to be really meaningful because it'll be blocked. It'll be blocked by the corporations. It'll be blocked by the Farm Bureau Federation and a whole range of people that basically dictate how the people on the agricultural committees vote. The same thing's true at the state level. I know in the state of Missouri, when I, I, was, I was told you can't get anything out of the agricultural committees in the state of Missouri unless the Farm, Missouri Farm Bureau signs off on it and Moag Industries, which is the industrial agriculture lobbyist down there. So they control it. You know, I think the only thing that's going to bring a fundamental change in farm policy is a, is a consumer taxpayer revolt. If, if the American taxpayer actually understood what their tax dollars that go for agriculture is supporting, they would demand change. You would have a revolt. They'd say, close it down. So I think that that's the only thing that's going to change it. I used to think that that was a, you know, just a, a wild dream. But I think the odds of that are improving. I think the odds are improving that we can have a consumer taxpayer revolt. There's a growing disenchantment, a growing distrust of the whole food system in this country today. You can go in and Google any of the names of the large newspapers and Google factory farms, industrial agriculture, whatever. You come up with a whole range of, of stories and they're critical of the whole situation that's out here today. So there's a, a growing public awareness that there's something fundamental going on out here. But I think one of the most important things is that the challenges that are confronting agriculture are the same challenges that are confronting society overall. The, the, the concerns that we share here in a conference like this that, about family farms are basically just one part of concerns that are shared by people all across the country. And if we can put together a coalition that brings those together, then we have a possibility of having fundamental change in all of those areas, all across the economy, all across society. On the antitrust issue, for example, that's not just in agriculture. Concentration of corporate power is everywhere, all across the country. We basically got a corporatist economy rather than a capitalist economy today. On the issue of climate change, you know, agriculture is one that's associated with it, but this is an opportunity basically to recreate agriculture. But if we go into the climate change and, and share and build the collaboration with other people who want to deal with the issue in other dimensions, then become much more powerful. Exploitation of rural communities. This isn't just happening to agricultural communities. There's exploitation of rural communities all across this country, whether they're mining towns or petroleum towns or whatever they are. We're suffering the same consequences there as we're suffering here. And when it's, the, it's the discrimination against rural culture that we see today, the marginalization of rural people as somehow being hicks or not up to it or whatever. That's the same kind of marginalization, discrimination that we see against minority groups and weaker groups politically all across the country. And we share those concerns with other people out here. I think we can address those. The transformation in an agriculture would address all of those. We see them being addressed today. The climate change, you know, if we deal with that, if we go to regenerative kind of agricultural systems, a diversified crop and livestock systems, then we can sequester the carbon in the soil and we can protect the environment from pollution and degradation. 
And you see those developing today in the regenerative and resilient agricultural movement, ecological agriculture, holistic management, things of this nature. When we talk about the threat to animal agriculture that comes from climate change, it's an opportunity to point out it's the industrial agricultural system that's contributing to climate change. If we get the animals back out on pasture on a diversified farming operation, we can begin to sequester the soil and rebuild the fertility of the soil, but also remove the carbon from the air and reduce the emissions of the other toxic chemicals that are really contributing to climate change. If we can go from the diversified from the factory farms to the diversified family farms. And as we do that, we can employ more people in agriculture. We can begin to restore the economic viability of rural communities. And we can reestablish rural communities as quality of life places to live where people want to live for the fresh air and the clean water and various other things, which gives opportunity to people across the state. This is about a transition from industrial agriculture, sustainable agriculture, that's one part of a much bigger movement that addresses a whole range of issues. In summary, we move from a sustainable agriculture, industrial agriculture to family farms. We have shared ecological social values with all kinds of other agricultural movements and all kinds of other groups all across society that are dealing with social issues, environmental issues, that agriculture is just one part of here today. And together, we can have through coalitions, we can have any kind of agriculture we want because we have the power to change the policies. The challenge is, is to turn this possibility of a consumer taxpayer revolt into a, a reality of change. You know, the, I think one of the hardest things for people in agriculture to do is, is going to be to admit that, that what we've been involved in through all of these decades simply isn't working and it isn't going to work. It, it wasn't easy for me. I had built a whole career and a whole education on one way of thinking about things and when I had to admit that that wasn't working and it wasn't going to work, it changed everything. And I understand that it's not easy to do, to say there's fun fundamentally wrong with the system that you feel trapped in, or perhaps you even like in some way. But I think that's what it's going to take. It's going to take the farm communities coming up and calling for big change and supporting big change. Over the years, I've come to the conclusion that we don't make really big changes until we have three conditions in place. We have to conclude first that the things that we're doing now aren't working and aren't going to work in the future. The second is, is that we have to know there, have to feel that there's something fundamentally better. We have to have kind of a vision of what it is that we want instead of what we have now. And the third is that we have to believe that it's possible to make the change, to get from here, to get to somewhere else. And that means that we're going to have to confront the status quo. And there is a powerful status quo, a powerful public relations propaganda machine out here that's promoting industrial agriculture and trying to protect it. It's one example that U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance is one, probably one of the bigger ones that was just put together maybe 10 years ago to, to fight this whole battle because of the growing public discomfort with the industrial agricultural system. Friends of the Earth went back and looked at the tax reports of nonprofit organizations, which are public information. Between 2009-2013, this one organization, U.S. Farmers Ranchers Alliance, spent over $30 million on campaign trying to convince us, basically, that industrial agriculture is no different than traditional family farming. It's just the next phase in modern farming, and we have to get used to it. They also uncovered 12 other so-called front groups that are spending about $25 million a year trying to convince the American consumer that there's nothing wrong and we need to stick with what we're doing. Everybody's going to starve to death if we don't. And it's not just those organizations. They're all supported by the commodity organizations, Farm Bureau and others. But all of these other organizations, community the commodity organizations, and agribusiness are spending money on their own outside of this, on that same sort of propaganda, trying to tell people that everything is just fine. If you don't agree it's everything's just fine, you don't have any alternatives anyway. So you might as well get used to it. What we have to do is expose the myths. We have to expose the myths, such as feeding the 
industrial agriculture is necessary to feed the world. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because that's what I did two years ago was talk about. It's full of fallacies. You know, we're, we're not feeding the hungry people of the world with our exports from this country. I think there's something like less than one half of one percent are going to the 19 hungriest countries in the world. We're going to the increasingly fluent populations that are growing out of China and India and various other places, not to the people that are hungry in those countries at all. We've we got to expose the myth that more than 70 percent of the people in the world today are not fed by industrial agriculture at all. They're fed, they're fed by smaller family farms, many of which we would call subsistence farms. And there's global research, plenty of research that shows that we can double or triple the yield on those farms without industrial agriculture, with sustainable, diversified farming practices that we would associate with traditional family farms. They can not only feed themselves, they can feed the rest of the world. We can abandon industrial agriculture and the world's not going to starve to death. And people in other countries are figuring out that everywhere you take industrial agriculture, you end up with the same health problems, a disease, a diabetes, heart disease, uh, high blood pressure, all of this stuff. They don't want their population to be sick like ours is by industrializing our food system. And the other type of thing is, is that we got to have industrial agriculture to keep food affordable in this country. We don't. You, you know, there was a reduction in the percentage of income we spent on food up to about the 1990s. The last 20 years, food prices have gone up faster than the overall consumer price index in this country. We continue to have cheap agricultural commodities, but the agricultural industry turns that into expensive junk food that they then market associated with all the health problems that we're getting here today, and they're not going to change that. In addition to that, it doesn't really make much difference in terms of cost of food, what we do on the farm in this country anymore, because less than 15% of what we spend for food actually goes to the farmer. If we had the increased cost of production, our farmers got 50% more for everything you produce. And the rest of the system was the same. Food prices would go up about 7 to 8 percent. Food prices went up more than that when we decided we were going to produce ethanol from our corn crop. 40 percent of the U.S. corn crop goes into ethanol. They went up more than that and never, nobody was saying, hey, everybody's going to starve. You know, we can afford to have good food in this country. It goes up, you know, the, the increase, the high price you pay for organic and natural food in the grocery stores is not a reflection of the cost of production overall. It's a reflection of the fact that it's treated as a niche market and the profit margins are large. It's also a reflection of the fact that the whole food processing distribution system is also subsidized to support the industrial food system, which makes it virtually impossible or very difficult to go out and create something different than that. You know, what I'm talking about is not a bunch of propaganda. There's gigabytes of information, which used to say reams of information of science that supports the alternative. I quoted some of this last year that says, okay, the industrial food system had a lot of output, but it's not feeding the hungry people. What we needed is diversified farming operations, diverse landscapes, reduced reliance on chemicals, holistic management systems that manage the health of the soils, diversified crop and livestock to build soil fertility, and build the health and to provide livelihoods for farmers that are in the areas of the country that need it most. It says these systems can compete productively, particularly on productivity, particularly in, in places that are under environmental stress and where people need the food most. You know, these are characteristics of, of traditional family farms, but we have to have policies in place that we're not going to have those policies until we expose the myth. The alternatives are out there in this country. Ecological farming, holistic management, environmental, I mean sus sustainable farming, regenerative farming, a whole range of farming systems out there. The challenge in this country is not increasing productivity, it is sustainability. The challenge is to make those alternatives a reality. That's what I'm talking about is changing policies. And I think OCM, and kind of winding down here, has, has a lot to contribute in, in helping to make this transition possible. When you look at the initiatives you're going to talk about here in OCM, they talk about managing corporate power to rural and urban areas. That whole messaging can be expanded where it's not just talking about corporate power to people in agriculture and people in regulators, but it's explaining this whole concept to society as a whole and explaining how the problems that you're confronting are a part of the problems that they're confronting so that you can begin to build coalitions going out to the larger area. I think the current presidential campaign 
provides an ideal environment in which you can talk about the issues really out in front and people will begin to listen to them because they're interested in who they're going to vote for in, in the primaries and the general election and so on. And I think OCM can lead the way in some of them, like when you talk about a moratorium on food and agricultural mergers, you can expand that messaging out and, and expose the myths that are going across society as a whole, that, that, that corporate power is beginning to run the whole country. It's not just dominating agriculture and dictating what farmers do. The corporations are beginning to call the shots all across the country and point out the fact that we really don't have a capitalist economy in this country anymore. We have a corporatist controlled economy. We have to restore the competitiveness into the markets, but it's not just agriculture. It's all across society that we have to share that same message, and I think that you can do that as well. And when you talk about, you know, the exploitation, that expand the message, exploitation of people in rural areas, then that's, that's happening all across rural and urban areas as well. And you can talk about the corporate takeover and of what's going on here. You know, the presidential campaign, it gives you an opportunity to talk about the need for a transition from industrial agriculture to sustainable agriculture or regenerative agriculture, an agriculture, you know, that addresses some of the issues that I've talked about. You can explain how this industrial agricultural system and industrial agriculture policies have farmers locked into a system that they're not really comfortable with, and if they had an opportunity then they would transition to something different and, and to argue for farm policies that, that at least give farmers that want to transition out of agriculture, industrial agriculture, to family farm kind of agriculture, that they have an equal opportunity to do that. Just as we share the risk for the industrial operation, let's at least say, let's share the risk of making that transition until you get to a point of sustainability. Let's provide economic security for family farmers again as a means of providing food security for the country. When you talk about the checkoff reform program, you can point out that this is a misuse of government funds and misuse of government power that's being abused all across society. It's not just about agriculture. There are all sorts of programs that are being distorted from the public purpose just simply to go toward lining the pockets of people that are already with positions of wealth and have economic and political power. It can become a broader message. I'm not telling you how to carry out your mission here. I'm just saying that there are opportunities here to, to broaden the mission, to share it with other people that are dealing with other farm groups, environmental groups, social justice groups, labor organizations, poverty groups, rural advocacy groups. The basic message should be that we need farm policies that will give at least as much support to those people that are trying to solve the problems as we're giving to the people that are creating the problems. You know, we, we know we have evidence that the current system's failed. We can have the kind of agriculture we want and we can get the policies to bring about. You know, I'm not so naive or idealistic to think that, that that's going to be easy. In fact, I'm accused many times of being naive and idealistic to believe in this ideal that I've talked about on the family farm. There's people that say, well, that's a myth. That's a myth. It never really existed that way. And my response is that if so, if it's a myth, if so, then it is no more so than are the basic ideals of our American democracy, of liberty and of justice for all. These may be myths, but they are ideals that are worth aspiring to, that are worth our efforts. These are ideals that we have to allow to guide us toward better ways to farm and better ways to live. And it's ideals that can guide us in developing the kind of policies that will get us there. You know, I understand the task is daunting, and as an individual, it may seem like, well, there's so little that I can do. But the power of the corporations are so great. There may be little that we can do, but there's no power greater than the power of the people when the people work together. That is the only power I know of that can really change the situation that we're in today with corporations, is the power of the people. 
I ran across a quote, a 1922 quote that was in a report to the president by a fellow by the name of Edward Hale, who was a Unitarian minister. And he said, I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. There's something that I ought to do, I can do, and by the grace of God, I will do. If we do what we ought to do, we can do that. And if we do that individually, then together, together, we can change things. We can change the greatest power. We can, we can change agriculture and change our society. And Edward Hale went on, and there was another quote I found with him. He says, together, together is the most inspiring word in the English language. Coming together is the beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. Together we can create any kind of agriculture that we want. Together we can make the ideal of an independent family agriculture a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much.